Today's text is from the Gospel of Matthew, reading from chapter 27, verse 57, to the end of chapter 28. From the Gospel of Matthew, here is the word of the Lord. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see, see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You were to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. From the Gospel of Matthew, this is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The death and resurrection of Jesus was not something that just happened. We're not dealing with chance or circumstance. Everything that happened to Jesus happened according to the eternal decree of God. Redemption was planned from before the foundation of the world. As Peter affirmed in his great Pentecost sermon, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And the Bible goes into rich and precise details in its prediction of who the Messiah would be, where he would come from, what he would do and suffer, and how he would rise from the grave. For example, Isaiah tells us that Jesus would be with the rich in his death. Some 800 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah knew how he would be buried. Here's our lesson. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, 
who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Jesus took the body, wrapped it in a, sorry, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled the big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Arimathea is a small town in the hills about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Joseph of Arimathea was a man of wealth and position. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish Supreme Court, as we recall. It was the membership of the Sanhedrin who had who'd spat in Jesus' face, struck him with their fists, condemned him, bound him up, and delivered him to Pilate that he might be killed. But as well as being a member of the Sanhedrin, Joseph was a follower of Jesus. And as Luke describes him, he was a good and upright man. He had not gone along with the Sanhedrin in their decision. He had protested. He, had, he stood up for Jesus, but it did not change what had to happen. The Savior had to suffer and die. But Joseph could provide a small service for Jesus. He could bury him. And so it was that after his Lord had died, Joseph of Arimathea went to see Pilate. It was the Jewish law that those who had died as Jesus had died were to be buried immediately the same day. It had been this way since the time of Moses. Moses recorded this in Deuteronomy. If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. But while this was the Jewish law, it was not the Roman law. The Roman custom was to let the bodies of the crucified rot on the cross as a terrible witness and warning to all who would defy the empire. Only with the permission of the imperial magistrate, and never in the case of a person charged with high treason, was the body taken down. But Pilate made an exception. And there are two reasons for this, one human and one divine. In human terms, Pilate knew that Jesus was not guilty of the charge. He knew that the crucifixion was an injustice. To refuse Jesus a decent burial would be to make what he knew to be a bad situation even worse. And perhaps Pilate still heard the warning voice of his wife ringing in his ears, don't have anything to do with that man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the real reason that Jesus was taken down from the cross and given a decent burial had to do with the decree of God. His burial had been ordained. You can read about it in Psalm 16, the Psalm of David. This is what it promises. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Jesus, the Holy One, would not see decay. The 16th Psalm says so. So with Pilate's permission, Joseph took the body of Jesus and prepared it for burial. He wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Nicodemus, also a member of the Sanhedrin, the one who would come to Jesus by night, helped by anointing the body with spices. Then the body was placed in Joseph's own tomb and the entranceway was secured by a large stone. The tomb was most likely in an old stone quarry. It would have had an antechamber and a low passage leading to the burial vault. The stone that sealed the tomb would have been shaped like a disc. Rolled into place, it would have fit into a slot in front of the entrance so that it would be very difficult to move. It would take several strong men to move it out of the way. Well, in spite of Jesus' death, the Sanhedrin was still worried. They remembered the promise of Jesus that on the third day he would rise. Now, they weren't worried because they believed he would actually rise. They weren't worried because they believed that Jesus was the king that Nathan was talking about when he said these words to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. They didn't believe at all, but they were worried about trickery. Worried 
that the disciples might come back and steal the body and fraudulently proclaim a, a, a resurrection. So to guard against that, the Sanhedrin went to Pilate and asked for a guard to be posted. Pilate wasn't impressed. It says in our lesson, take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. A translation that better renders the sense of what Pilate is saying is this. You have a guard of soldiers. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. As if Pilate were saying, you were afraid of Jesus when he was alive. You were afraid of him now that he's dead. Guard the body if you want, but use your own temple guard for the job. My soldiers won't be involved in any way in this sort of foolishness. And that's what happened. The lesson continues. They went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. You see how very strange their thinking was, how very much divorced from reality. By this time, the disciples were in no condition to do much of anything, never mind steal a body and invent a brand new religion. Their leader had been tortured and killed. All they wanted to do was avoid the same accusation of torture and escape from Jerusalem with their lives. They wanted to go back home and start over again, pick up the pieces and get back to fishing. Starting their own religion based upon a lie that someone who was dead was really alive never occurred to them. Why should it? Let's digress a bit. The Sanhedrin was not alone in its strange thinking. The denials that are going on this day are just as strange. For example, some say that Jesus rose because the wrong man had been put to death in the first place. He was never crucified. In the turmoil and hubbub before the crucifixion, someone in the crowd standing there and minding his own business was mistaken for Jesus, who at the time had been flogged and beaten and was wearing a crown of thorns on his head. Well, how likely is that? Incidentally, this is the theory held in the Koran. It's one of the proofs that the Koran is not from God, but from somewhere else. Others say that he didn't die on the cross. He only fainted. This is called the swoon theory. It goes like this. Jesus didn't last as long on the cross as most people did. A crucified person could last on the cross for days. Jesus only hung there for about three hours. And so when he was taken down, he wasn't really dead. He was in sort of a coma. When he was buried, the coolness of the tomb revived him. He was able to get up. Apparently, he was also able to unwrap himself from the grave clothes, push a huge stone away from the tomb entrance, overpower a host of temple guards, and limp to his disciples, claiming to be a victor over death. Again, it's too silly for words. He was systematically tortured. He was beaten. He was crucified. He was stabbed with a spear to make sure he was dead. Roman flogging would have been enough to kill him, even if he hadn't been hung on the cross. The Roman soldiers were professionals when it came to killing. The cross made no compromises. Jesus was buried because he was dead. How about this one? Some say that the authorities themselves took the body to prevent the disciples from doing so. It was in this way they were able to control the situation. Of course, the same people who maintain this theory are at a loss to explain why the authorities didn't simply produce the body when news of the resurrection began to circulate. Some say it was a mass hallucination the disciples suffered, but again, if that were the case, why couldn't the body be produced? And here's one more. This one was popular at the seminary that Ken attended. It's the sort of thing people like religious writer Tom Harper believe. I remember him from the star. It's been a long time since I read him, thank goodness. They maintain that while there was no bodily resurrection, the real miracle of Easter was that the disciples came to faith and were transformed. While it is true that they came to faith and were transformed, there is no way to account for such a transformation outside of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The simple and undeniable truth is this. The disciples proclaimed the resurrection because they had met the risen Jesus. He was dead, really dead, dead as you and I understand dead, and yet he came back to life. He rose up bodily from the grave. The Old Testament said it would happen this way. Before he died, Jesus said it would happen this way. After he rose from the dead, Jesus brought the message home. We saw that in our lesson this morning, when Jesus appeared to the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, they were devastated because of their master's death. Jesus came alongside them and rebuked them for missing the obvious. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Nothing less than the physical, bodily resurrection can account for what happened. I still got to go back to this Tom Harper theory. There's no bodily resurrection, but the real miracle is that the disciples came to faith and were transformed. Faith and a lie, that transformed them somehow. You do it like it's a, it's, it's a face palm, right? Like, I just... <laughs> now, early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that's the wife of Clopas and the aunt of Jesus, went to look at the tomb. As Mark tells us, they had more spices with which to anoint Jesus' body, and then it happened. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of them that they shook and became like dead men. So we need to be clear here. The tomb was not open to let Jesus out, but to let the witnesses in. Jesus didn't need earthquakes. He didn't need angels. In his resurrected body, Jesus could suddenly appear and then disappear. He could somehow go through locked doors. The tomb could not hold him either. No, this happened so that the witnesses could see for themselves the wonderful fulfillment of what God had promised in so many ways long ago. The angel said to the, woman, to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. The angelic commission is quickly confirmed by Jesus himself. He appeared to the women suddenly. He told them not to be afraid. And then he confirmed the angelic instructions. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Go to Galilee. Why there? Well, for one, it was familiar territory. It's where Jesus carried out most of his ministry. And it's also where Isaiah said the Messiah would be found. These words come from Isaiah 9. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future... He will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee so far away from Jerusalem. Galilee so short of the advantages that were available in the south. Galilee so poor and despised by the crowd. Galilee the butt of jokes and scorn. Yet it was here that the Savior did so much of his work. And here the risen Savior would be seen by his disciples. What this means is that what Jesus did on the cross is meant for all those who are poor in spirit, for all those who know their need and their helplessness. Paul described them this way. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Beloved Jesus has come to seek and save the lost sheep, the lost sheep of Israel and of the nations. The Old Testament tells us about this mission of Jesus when it describes the covenant God made with Abraham. God promised in that covenant that Abraham would be the father of a great nation, that he would be given a land flowing with milk and honey, and that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And while he is in Galilee, on the border between Israel and the Gentile territories, Jesus will give them the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's the glorious consummation of resurrection. Lost sinners from all nations, more than can be counted, 
will be taught of the one who came to make peace between God and man. They will hear of his dying for their sins and rising to give them life, and they will bow down and submit themselves to him with humble, cheerful hearts. They will come to know the Holy Spirit alive in their hearts, will find power to obey, love, and please their Heavenly Father. They will enjoy fellowship with him who has promised to be with them through thick and thin, even to the very end of the age. And at last, they will enter the kingdom which God has prepared, the kingdom where all tears are wiped away and sorrow and sighing flee forever away. Beloved, it is all so very real, so very true, so take heart this Easter Lord's Day, This is indeed the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as we rejoice and are glad in the risen Christ. In his name, amen.